everyone, and welcome to Varsity Tutors, where we've had the chance to learn from our friends at Wonders of Wildlife about all sorts of amazing animals, from those flying high in the sky to those deep in the sea. We've had the chance to see how animals all work together to create the world we know today. But did you know that some of the most important animals are those right under our feet? The dirt below us is full of incredible creatures that are essential to our ecosystems. And today, we're learning about a very special type of species, and that is our decomposers. Now, throughout today's lesson, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to participate and to test our knowledge. So you'll want to use that chat on the right hand side of your screen to both ask and answer questions all throughout the lesson. If we don't get to anything right away, not to worry, we'll have a couple of minutes right toward the end specifically for Q&A. And before I spoil too much of the lesson, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to your instructor for today, Sarah Mobley. Thank you so much for the introduction. Like Haley said, my name is Sarah Mobley, and I am a lead educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. Thank you guys so very much for being here with me today. And before we get started, I wanted, before we get started talking about decomposers, I wanted to give you guys just a brief introduction on where I am and our facility. So I live in Springfield, Missouri. And sometimes Springfield, Missouri, or just Missouri in general, is called the Show Me State. And here at Wonders of Wildlife, we take that nickname to a whole new level. At Wonders of Wildlife, it is a completely immersive experience into the environments of the world. From ocean all the way to land animals, there are 1.5 miles of exhibits and over a hundred or 800 species to learn about and see. And there's just so much more than that. But I am so happy to have you guys here with me today. And today we're learning about decomposers. So are you guys ready to learn about some decomposers? As always, I like to start off by asking you guys a question. So in your chat box, can you tell me what are decomposers? What does it mean to be a decomposer? I'm seeing a lot of really great answers out there already. Worms are decomposers. They break down things. They eat things that aren't alive anymore. Those are all really great grasses and you guys are all right on the money and super duper close. A basic general definition of a decomposer is a decomposer is a living thing that breaks down dead plants, animals, or waste. So what type of animals out there or other things are decomposers? In your guys' chat box, can you maybe tell me some things that you think might be decomposers? Worms, bugs, yeah, there are three main groups of decomposers. So we have fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. A really awesome way to remember those three categories is FBI. So F stands for fungi, B stands for bacteria, and then the I stands for invertebrates. So if you're ever wondering or need to remember the three types of decomposers, you can just think of FBI, and that's a really good way to help you remember the three types of decomposers. So let's look closely into each of these different groups and break them down just a little bit more. First, we have fungi. So normally, when we think of fungi, we think of mushrooms. However, mold and yeast are actually fungus as well. Fungi, they release enzymes that break down that once living organism. And then they're able to soak in all of that nutrients. Second is bacteria. So bacteria is little tiny microorganisms that we can't even see with a naked eye and they act like decomposers sometimes as well. That doesn't mean that all bacteria is decomposers, and we'll talk about that some more with the inverts as well, but bacteria is really important to the decomposition inside of landfills 
So landfills is where all of our waste goes um, and we are able to use that bacteria for our, our advantage and it helps break down those food scraps and plant matter and even paper matter as well inside of the landfills so that we can you know, create a good composition inside of those landfills. And then of course, last but not least, we have invertebrates. So invertebrates are normally animals that don't have a backbone. So you and I are, don't, we have backbones and bones in our body. Invertebrates, they don't have those backbones. So the main inverts that we think of, of course, are worms when it comes to being decomposers. However, there are a lot of other insects that decompose organic matter. Beetles, millipedes, um, like we said, a lot of worm species, all those decompose that once living matter. Now, that doesn't mean that all insects are decomposers. There's a lot of insects out there that aren't um, butterflies, uh, praying mantises, all of those different insects, even though they're invertebrates, they're not necessarily decomposers because they eat other things that aren't decaying matter. But there are quite a few species of insects out there that are decomposers. One of them, and it's a pretty famous one, really gross one, is the dung beetle. And I know it sounds really gross to us, but their main diet for a dung beetle is manure from other animals, normally from herbivores like cows and deer and all those animals that just eat the plants and they don't eat any meat. So herbivores that eat only grass and the dung beetle has special mouth parts that help them suck out all the nutrients from that manure. And sometimes when we think of the dung beetles, we think of them like rolling the little poop balls everywhere. So they're pretty cool. But those guys are decomposers because they take that manure that was once a living organism and then change it and recycle it into something else. In your guys' chat box though, can you tell me why decomposers are important? Why do we why do we need them? Why are these little tiny animals like worms and dung beetles and mushrooms and even bacteria that we can't even see with our eyeballs, why are they important to us humans in the world? They eat things that we don't eat. That's a good guess. They help the planet, yeah. They are good for the environment. Those are all really awesome guesses, guys. And they're all very true. But a really good way, and long story short, is why they're so important is basically because we can't live without them. We would not be able to survive without decomposers eating and recycling that waste and that organic matter we would be up to our necks in trash and up to our necks in waste and we would live around a lot of really gross things if it wasn't for those decomposers eating all of that waste. How does that work though? How can they be recycling that waste? Why do they recycle that waste? Let's talk about the food chain. A food chain describes how energy and nutrients move through the ecosystem. So every food chain normally starts with the sun. The sun supplies the plants and the animals with energy. In this food chain that you guys are seeing on the screen, the sun is shining down on an orange tree and giving the orange tree the energy to grow all of those delicious oranges. Once those oranges are ripe, they will start to fall off of the tree, which that's where the mouse comes into play. The mouse is gonna snack on those oranges that fell from the tree. While the mouse is busy eating their oranges, just having a good lunch, the hawk that's flying by is gonna spot that mouse and that mouse is gonna become the hawk's dinner. 
But what about the decomposers? I see some mushrooms there, but like, where do they come into play with that whole food chain that we just talked about with the sun and the orange tree and the mouse and the hawk? I didn't talk about any mushrooms. Can you guys in your chat box tell me where you think the decomposers will come into play with this food chain that we see in front of us? Where are those decomposers going to come into play? Eating the oranges, decomposing the leftovers. Those are all really great ways. You guys know a lot about decomposers. Um, so here's a few ways that I found decomposers would fit into this food chain. So number one is the leftover oranges. The oranges might be too big for the mouse to eat, or the mouse may not be able to finish before the hawk eats the mouse for lunch. So there's going to be some leftover orange peels and leftover fruit. So the decomposers are going to eat that. Um, what about the leftover mouse droppings? The mouse is probably going to leave some droppings behind by the tree. Decomposers eat that waste as well, that manure. And then number three is the pellets left by the hawk. So all birds of prey or um, raptors, they leave pellets. So normally they're not chewing their food. They are just swallowing the mouse whole. So what they do and what that pellet means is that they're going to combine all of those bones and the stuff that they can't digest and vomit it back up. So that's called a pellet. So the hawk might vomit up those mouse bones and then the decomposers are gonna come around and decompose that out, that pellet from the hawk. And then there was one that we didn't mention during our food chain, but that's falling leaves. So the orange tree has leaves and especially around this time of year, all of our leaves are turning really pretty colors and they're falling off the trees. So once those leaves fall, the decomposers will decompose those leaves as well. Now that we have a little bit more information about decomposers, I actually have a really awesome decomposer friend with me today that I am going to get out. So if you give me just a second, I am going to get out my little decomposer friend to show you. Does anybody have any guesses in the chat what our decomposer friend might be? Does anybody have any guesses in the chat what this decomposer is? I'm going to put his container below us. I'm hearing, I'm seeing a centipede, millipede. Yeah, so these guys are giant African millipedes. So if they're called giant African millipedes, that means that they live in Africa, of course, and they also have the word giant in their name. He seems like a pretty big bug. However, he's not giant, but would you believe me if I told you that these guys get up to 12 inches. So that's about the size of a ruler and about the size of my forearm. So they still have a lot of growing to do, but does anybody in the chat have any guesses on how many legs these guys have? Can you see all of his little legs moving? How many legs do you think they have? 
I'm seeing a lot of guesses, a lot of really big numbers. 100, 1,000. Oh my goodness, a million. So many good numbers. So they actually only have about three to 400 legs. And they're going to have their legs grow to the segments of their body. So as they get bigger, they're gonna grow more segments and grow more legs along with those segments. So they might only have 300 legs now, but here in a few years, they might have 350 or uh, 400 legs, but they won't have a million legs, even though it kind of looks like it. What other things do you guys see on this millipede? What other body parts do you see? I see their antennas. So these guys are mainly nocturnal animals and they spend a lot of their daytime underground. So because they do that, they don't have really great eyesight. They have eyes, but they're very simple eyes and they don't see very well. So they use those antennas to help them see. Give you guys a little better look about how big he is. So they use those antennas to feel around and see. And then they use all of those legs to help them dig and burrow underground. Then at night, they're gonna come out of their burrows and find all of that decaying matter that is left behind throughout the day. Their main diet in the wild is going to be leftover fruits and veggies that fall off of fruit trees and plants. And then they're also going to eat a lot of the, the falling leaves that we talked about earlier. Here at Wonders of Wildlife, we feed them some salads so they get a lot of fruits and veggies here as well, just like their native diet. But what they're going to do, since they're decomposers, is they're going to eat all of that organic matter. And then they are going to recycle it inside their body. And then whatever comes out is going to be really nutritious soil that we can use to plant more veggies and more fruit. He's pretty cool. He kind of feels all of his little legs. It kind of feels like a little toothbrush. They're pretty sticky. So he has a really good grip with all of his legs. But I am going to switch back over to my main camera and talk about just a few more things while I put him away. Hello, I'm back. I'm not as cool as the millipede. But before I answer some of your guys' really awesome questions that I know you have, I want to talk about a few more things with decomposers. So how can we help? How can we help decomposers like these giant African millipedes that we saw and the mushrooms that we have in our backyards? How can we help these guys? They're so tiny and so small that sometimes it's sometimes hard to know how we can help. Well, first, we like to say leave the leaves. So during this time of year, we have those leaves falling and we would like to kind of pick them up sometimes. We like to rake them up and um, clean them up. However, those are really nutritious and big parts of these decomposers diets. So in order to have them have food, 
we would like to leave those leaves in our yard. And then those decomposers like those mushrooms and the worms in our backyard are gonna come around during the winter and decompose all of those leaves. I have the millipede still on me. He's not in his enclosure yet. Sorry guys. Next is going to be to compost. Does anybody know in the chat what it means? What is it? What is a compost? So to compost um, is a great way to help decomposers because we're kind of helping them with their job and we're kind of doing their job for them, to be honest with you. But we can have a compost bin in our backyard or in our garage where we put the waste in our compost bin and waste like eggshells or our leftover food that we maybe didn't eat for dinner and put that all in our compost bin. And after a while, that compost works itself and creates soil that we will then put out in our gardens and we will be able to grow more veggies and plants that we can survive on. Number three, which is a really awesome, good way to help decomposers, even though it's pretty small, is to let them work. So I know that sometimes we can be a little afraid of bugs and worms are maybe a little slimy and scary, but to allow them to just work, leave them alone in your backyard. So it's always best just to leave them alone and let them do what they need to do and let them keep composting. They are awesome at their jobs. And so when we take them away from them, sometimes we lose, um, that's how, you know, we lose our species and they stop composting. Last but not least, which is a little weird, is a worm farm. So worm farms are awesome and you can have your own little worm farm. It is kind of like a smaller version of a compost bin. And what you would do is you would throw in your food scraps from home and you will throw in your, you know, same thing with your compost bin, your eggshells and your leftover fruit and veggies. And you will have your own little worm colony that will then eat and break down all of those, that waste. And then they will create soil. And then same thing with your compost bin. You will be able to use that soil for different things, such as planting flowers in your backyard and growing your own fruits and veggie trees. And plus you'll just have like a whole bunch of little worm pet friends and they're pretty cool. But I'm sure that you guys have so many questions for me, and I bet they're all great, and I would love to answer them for you. All right. Awesome. So first and possibly the most important question of the day, does our millipede friend have a name? Um, so we have a colony, about seven to ten millipedes. So they're a little hard to tell apart right now. So they do not have names, but sometimes we like to make some up and call them Millie or Miley or Million, something along those lines that kind of fit with the millipede name. Love it. That is wonderful. And we got lots of mixed results from students. Not, not very many students who have seen a millipede quite that size, but mixed yes. results from some students who say they see creatures like millipedes and centipedes all the time and others who say they don't think they've ever seen one. So could you talk to us a little bit more about where we could expect to find millipedes? Where do they live? Yeah, so they live pretty much everywhere besides Antarctica. Here in the United States, we really actually don't have many millipede species. Um, we only have two or three, but a lot of the times they live in really tropical rainforesty areas that have a lot of that leaf litter and that diversity. Um, so these guys, of course, are not native to the United States. However, something I did not talk about, which is kind of relevant, is that these guys are what we consider invasive species, or they can be. 
So if we were to allow them to reproduce in the United States, they would be able to reproduce and take over our ecosystems and maybe take food away from some of our other native millipedes and some of our other native um, decomposers as well. So that's why here at Wonders of Wildlife, we have a lot of different trainings and we are trained on invasive species and we always keep them double contained so that we're not um, accidentally doing something that we're not supposed to by law. But these guys, um, we have a lot of centipede species here in the United States and centipedes can be venomous and have a pretty gnarly bite to them. So we always just recommend to leave them alone if you don't actually know, um, if you're not able to identify the species, because they can be kind of hard to tell apart. They have a lot of legs. And so sometimes millipedes and centipedes look pretty much the same, but they can be found pretty much all around the world. Awesome. So we had another really common question. And so we'd love to have you paint us a picture. We talked about how important these decomposers are. So what would a world look like if we didn't have decomposers in it? That is a really, really awesome question. So basically we would live in a world full of waste and really, really gross things. And we really wouldn't be able to survive because nothing would grow. So because the waste isn't being recycled into new soil and new nutrients and we're not having, you know, the waste being recycled, nothing's going to grow. They don't have enough nutrition. They don't have enough vitamins and energy to grow new things. So everything is part of a big circle of life. So you have to, you know, have the decomposing matter to create that new soil to grow those new things. So decomposers are probably one of the most important species in the animal kingdom because everything relies on decomposers. Even the little tiny bacteria that we can't see play those huge roles in these large ecosystems. Wow. Now, we talked about decomposers and in particular some of these millipedes feeding on, you know, either things that herbivores have left behind or plants themselves. So we have lots of curious and maybe, you know, a little concerned students who want to know whether they should fear being eaten by a decomposer. So do decomposers ever eat maybe not herbivores or maybe even people? That is a really good question. Um, and don't be afraid, <laughs> it is okay. Um, but however, anything that uh, passes away, whether it is, you know, the grass and the leaves that we talked about, or animals slash humans passing away, our bodies are decomposed. And that is due to decomposers. But it is okay, because that just means that it's being recycled into new nutrients, but you don't need to worry about that right now. Okay, so everyone can take a deep <laughs> breath because I, I, we don't need to worry about having to outrun that millipede with all of its many legs. They're not coming after us now. <laughs> all right, so we also had lots and lots of questions around how long it takes decomposers to decompose things, and in particular, what some of the fastest decomposers are. So could you talk to us a little bit there? Ooh, that's a really good question. I'm actually not sure who's the fastest decomposer. I'm going to assume that it's inverts because they are actively eating that matter, but it takes anywhere between a few weeks, maybe to even a year, depending on, you know, bacteria it takes a little bit longer than those inverts do to decompose things. It also depends on what they're decomposing. If they're decomposing a little tiny leaf that fell from the tree, it's not going to take as long than maybe a larger animal that has passed away that they're trying to decompose, and it might take a longer amount of time. But I'm not sure who's the fastest. That's a really good question that I'll have to look up later. 
to say possibly a good question for further research for our yes. curious students. Awesome. Now, could, uh, speaking of further research, if our students are curious about trying to find some of these decomposers, whether they're fungi or maybe they're some of the, uh, the bugs that we talked about in the wild, what are some places they might want to look? Yeah. So our backyards are way more diverse than what you think they are. So if you are ever in your backyard playing, I bet during the right time of year, as long as it's not dead in the winter and there's a foot of snow outside, I bet you can find a worm or you can find a mushroom growing underneath of a tree. Same with being on a hike. If you ever want to take just nature walks outside and take a little you know, traveling tote with you and collect some of those mushrooms um, to take home and study them and look at them under a microscope. Mushrooms are, are simple organisms. However, they are really cool organisms. And um, I didn't mention this too much, but the largest living organism is actually a honey mushroom. And it's, I believe, an organ, and it is miles long underneath ground. And it's just one big, giant underground mushroom. So anywhere outside, I bet you could find some sort of decomposer that you can study and you can look at. Wow, that is really pretty amazing. Now, um, we also have some questions around whether different decomposers have to compete with one another for resources, for food, and whether they ever work together. So could you talk to us a little bit about the types of relationships either between decomposers or decomposers and other plants or animals? Yeah, a lot of their food overlaps. However, they, they eat that food in such a different way that they're not necessarily competing all that much. You know, you're going to have worms that are going to live closely with, you know, that bacteria. There is a little fun fact. There is a whole bunch of bacteria in one single, like, piece of soil. So there is about 40 million bacteria in one gram of soil. So there's a whole bunch of bacteria that is co-living with those other species, but they're decomposing in such a different way that they don't necessarily have to worry about the worms eating all their food because the amount of food that they have is so abundant and they're always going to be able to find something to decompose. Then they work together as a team sometimes. You can, you know, find different um, carcasses that might have different animals on them that are all decomposing and working together for that same cause. Wow. Now we had some, um, some, some students who were paying pretty close attention to some of the processes that you were talking about. And we're wondering, this is kind of a two-part question. One, uh, whether some of our, our millipedes and centipedes and our other creature decomposers have things like eyes to see the things they need to go decompose and a mouth to eat the things that they need to decompose. And then how does something like fungi that we think probably doesn't have a mouth and probably doesn't have eyes go about finding and consuming the things that it decomposes? Yeah. So with our giant African millipede that we saw, they do have eyes. They're very tiny and they are very simple eyes. They don't see like you and I do. And a lot of insects don't necessarily see like you and I do. They normally see light. So if they're outside and it's the middle of the day, they're gonna see all of that light around them. But if it's dark outside or they're underneath a tree or a big bird uh, flies by, they're gonna be able to detect that light change. A lot of the times insects, um, like the giant African millipede and other decomposers, they use their antennas to help them feel around. Um, all insects have very special mouthpieces um, and mouth parts, um, like that dung beetle that we talked about. They have special mouth parts that help them eat the food that they're eating. Their mouths are very, very tiny. 
um, and they would not be able to uh, bite us as humans or other animals because their mouths are so tiny and they're made specifically for that decaying matter um, that they're eating. As for um, what other, what was our second question, Haley? <laughs> Just whether things like fungi that oh we don't necessarily yes. see as having a, a visible mouth, how they go about con consuming and decomposing things. Fungus and bacteria, they decompose on the tiniest little microscopic level, and we can't really see it with uh, a naked eye. So fungi, they re release an enzyme that will kind of slowly decompose that matter and make it almost, I don't want to say liquid because it is such a, a complicated uh, process that fungi are going through. And then they absorb it through their pores and through their stem, almost like, for a lack of better words, how trees absorb water through the soil. They have those roots that they're absorbing the water into their trunks. Um, fungi have those little enzymes that they're absorbing that water in through their, their spout and into their pores and gills along the mushroom. Wow, that is pretty incredible that we can have so many different types of species with very different anatomies and ways that they're going about things that are accomplishing a really similar task. Um, now, we had a couple kind of creepy crawly questions that have come into the mix as well. And one that we've been getting a lot of uh, is whether worms can become multiple worms if you cut them, if, they, if they're broken up. So could you clarify for us, is this fact or fiction? Can we split up a worm into two smaller worms? Yes, that is a very common uh, question when it comes to worms, because I feel like everyone has heard that you can cut a worm in half and you'll have two different worms. So it is somewhat true. However, it is somewhat not true. So most worms, almost every worm, can regrow their tail. So they have two different segments of their body. They have their head half, and then they have their tail. And if their tail were to accidentally be amputated, most worms can grow that tail back. And then many other worms, like earthworms, they can lose a good part of their body and maybe grow it back. However, it depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the location that they're cut. It depends on maybe what their environment looks like. If it is really, really cold outside and they accidentally get their tail cut off, they may not have enough energy to grow that tail back. Um, and also maybe how clean the cut was if, you know, they accidentally got bit by a little mouse or something, it might be too injured to grow back. But I recommend, please don't go cutting worms in half and hoping that they grow into more worms. Um, that is not always the case, but they are able to regenerate parts of their body if they were to accidentally be cut in half. Wow. Well, um, I know we get to we get to take a look at some pretty cool decomposers today, and who we're going to call Millie for the purposes of our class today. Our millipede is a pretty cool looking decomposer. Are there any interesting, cool looking decomposers that we didn't get a chance to check out today that students might want to do some research on on their own? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, the decomposer world is so diverse. And when we think of, I, I love mushrooms, so I always kind of go back to fungi and mushrooms. And we all have this like vision in our head on what all mushrooms look like, but there are some really crazy looking mushrooms out there. So if you are really interested in decomposers, I would definitely suggest mushrooms. And then I also really enjoy beetles. So I kind of talked about the dung beetle a little bit. There are a whole bunch of different species of dung beetle. We even have dung beetles here in the United States. And they all eat the manure in a different way. So there's rolling dung beetles and there's burying dung beetles and burrowing dung beetles. And it's all what they do with that manure 
that they are split into different categories. So if you really want to see some really cool organisms, um, mushrooms for sure, and then dung beetles are at my next uh, my next suggestion if you're looking to research some decomposers, but they're all really cool. Awesome. That's fantastic. I know we even had some students in the chat who knew a little bit about some favorite decomposers, decomposers of their own, maybe even some mushrooms that glow in the dark. Do you want to fact check me on that one? Yeah, so not all mushrooms, but there are some mushrooms that are bioluminescent that have the same uh, process that fireflies and other maybe like jelly jellies that they glow in the dark. Um, so mushrooms are really awesome and some of them do glow in the dark. Wow. Well, now this is a this is a pretty fun one. We had a couple of students who were asking whether if a decomposer were to pass away, would the decomposer then be decomposed? <laughs> yes, it would. You guys are getting on to how food chains work. You guys got it. So if for some reason that worm or that plant, so the fungi, the mushrooms, they would be decomposed by other decomposers, recycled into more nutrients. Wow. Now, um, we also had lots and lots of students who are already so inspired to get out there and help decomposers of all kinds and help those decomposers help the rest of the world. So do you have other kind of final advice for students who are interested in either learning more about decomposers, learning more about the food chain, about ecosystems, and about how they can help? Yeah. As always, I like to tell you guys to volunteer and just do your research. Um, find that one decomposer that you're really passionate about and research if there's any citizen science programs that go with that decomposer. Um, you know, we think of decomposers being this vast um, population of worms. I mean, worms are everywhere, right? But there might be areas where worms are struggling and you're able to help those worms at home. But going out and volunteering at your local zoo or aquarium or, you know, your local watershed that's going out and doing renovations on these forests and fields um, that all revolve around decomposers, even going outside and planting your own garden in your backyard where you add some worms in, that is all helping the big picture of things. Wonderful. And everyone was so excited to get to meet Millie today. But for those of our students who are excited to learn more about some of the other creatures under your care at Wonders of Wildlife, we had lots of students who are wondering, do they have to live to be able to chickens, or are there some other ways that they can seek further information or maybe get to even virtually meet some of our other friends at the Museum and Aquarium? Yeah, so we are here with Varsity Tutors once a month, so definitely check us out. Um, whenever we're here, but we also offer virtual programming that you can check out on our website, which is www.wonderswildlife.org, and you can check out all of our virtual programming and join us for live events uh, where we can meet some other animals. We have um, a whole bunch of different ambassador animals, everything from non-venomous snakes to turtles and um, an armadillo that we have little surprise guests on um, during some of our live streams and other places like that. So definitely check out our website and we are here with Varsity Tutors every month. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And yes, I would encourage everyone who enjoyed getting to learn from Sarah today and to meet our special guest today to rejoin us next month and in future months. But in the meantime, thank you so much once again for joining. Thank you for all of the thoughtful questions and comments and fun facts that we saw in the chat. That was wonderful. Uh, we hope to see you all again next month. But in the meantime, feel free to join us in another Varsity Tutor Star Course soon. Thanks, everyone.